looked at a lot of cool gear today, um, whether it's a medical kit, a ham radio, a firearm, if you buy it, read the manual and stick it under your bed, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. Uh, so you've got to train. Uh, Stuart Rhodes is the founder of Oath Keepers. He once uh, said that uh, training trumps gear, community trumps training. So that's really the, the end goal of everything. It's not just to buy a bunch of gear, but to build a community of people that know how to use it. How do advance this kind of in line with what the Missouri Militia's core mission is, which is to build a, a group of NCOs for the state. Uh, we'll kind of get into that in a minute. But uh, it's modeled after the special forces. They generally have teams of 10 to 12 guys they drop behind enemy lines. Their job isn't to fight. Their job is to train people to fight. They're the ones that have the skills and the abilities to help other people, whether it's clean up a tornado or whatever else. Uh, so between these two organizations, we work together to try and fulfill this mission. So the Missouri Militia, uh, it's actually chartered in the Constitution of Missouri. Most people don't know this, but uh, everyone under, what is that, Title V, Chapter 41 of the Missouri Constitution is a member of the militia. You're 18 to 64 years old. The only difference with our organization, while well, we are statewide, is we get together and train um, regularly. Most people don't. Uh, our organization does have contacts in Jefferson City, and technically we can be called up by the government. But uh, we are above the board. Um, you know, we work within that. And again, you, per the Constitution of the state, everyone is a member of the Missouri Militia. <coughs> All right. The militias have gotten a very bad rap in the media. It's got kind of a bad word to it. So that's why the Oath Keepers one of the community preparedness teams. It's really the same thing. I highly recommend, these are two movies made by the Oath Keeper National Organization. First one is Molan Labe, came out a couple of years ago. Second one, Midnight Ride, just came out this year. You can buy them, I think they're $20 from the website. You can buy them from the local chapter or you can watch them online for free. Phenomenal education, every American should watch them. And this isn't one man's opinion, this is going through the historical documents, there's interviews with people from all over the country on what the role of the militia, and really, you know, the militia is, is the people. What, what it means to be an American, we've very much lost touch of that, so I highly recommend watching this. All right, so great little, uh, great little saying, General Hugh Percy's, I got this from an apple seed I went to once, uh, really brought it home to me. He once boasted before the Revolutionary War that he could cross the colonies with his troops, and he said, yelled all the male colonists with no resistance. No one would dare raise resistance Colonists were ineffective and cowards. All right, Lexington and Concord. He was at Lexington and Concord. He was part of the British Army. The entire Continental British Army came within one hour of being completely destroyed that day. Uh, in a later letter, Percy wrote, "Whoever looks upon them as an irregular mob will find himself much mistaken. They have men amongst them who know well what they are about." Uh, great quote. So, how did these Continentals do this? You know, I, I, that, you know, did everybody just grab the rifle and run into the street? You know, Paul Revere just rode around yelling. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen that easily. Um, they practiced and they prepared. Every town practiced regularly. The militias drilled, the committees of, uh, committees of communication, of correspondence, they called it committees of correspondence, communicated. Paul Revere was one of several riders. He had a route he rode. He hit one point, several riders went out from that point. It was a network. They had it all put together beforehand. We have cell phones, we have email, and we can't do anything near what they can do then. <laughs> uh, a little quote from Rommel, it says, first class training is the best welfare for troops. The more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. Uh, they were ready. <coughs> they didn't wait until the last minute to do something. All right, why would we need um, a militia now, or 
people that are prepared now. Just some things that are going on around the world, and this is actually a little dated, there's been a lot more since we did this slide. Uh, foreign and domestic terror acts, just happened, what, last week? Um, chemicals in modern life, hazardous materials, we saw that in Jaffa, we saw that uh, in Katrina, you know, there's people exposed to 9-11, people were exposed to stuff. Uh, volatile weather patterns, uh, seismic activity, New Madrid Fault, they live on it. So, uh, people are more <coughs> vulnerable than ever before in a lot of ways. Um, one little analogy I like to ask people is, kind of brings this home, I think, puts it more modern, small perspective. You're driving down the road, you have a car accident, and your kid's in the backseat, your grandkid, whatever, um, bleeding to death. The majority of Americans would hope the cell phone works, dial 911, and wait. Maybe try to stop the bleeding, but how many really know how to identify what kind of bleeding it is and how to stop it? How many have a kit like this handy to try and do anything with? Probably some people in this room, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but for the majority of people, they just don't. They don't think about it. They're not prepared. You know, had the colonists been like that, this would be a very different country today. You know, you got to think ahead and be ready to do these things. And the time to do it is now, not wait till the last minute. All right, we talked about uh, the core NCO core that we're trying to see it around the state, the CPT teams. Um, this is not the community, this is not the neighborhood watch in our area. I just grabbed this off the internet. But one of our members, um, recently there has been some crime in their neighborhood. And Tim mentioned that he was going out on, uh, they started a neighborhood watch, he's been going out on patrol. Well, a lot of the skills he learned from training, using the radio, basic patrol operations, you know, preparedness, things like that, he was able to help. So I like this picture because you see there's, there's three paid officers over on the corner. So imagine that street. You know, those three guys have who knows how much area to patrol. Well, now if there's a problem, all these other people come flocking out to help. You know, that, that's, that's, the force, that's where the word force multiplier comes from. Instead of three guys with a huge area to patrol, you now have 20 people on that street keeping an eye out. What we found is whenever there's a gun grab or a terrorist attack, people start emailing these organizations to come out, and then it kind of tapers off. You're going to find that. Um, but if you become a member of either organization and, and take this stuff seriously and train, you're going to be somebody that can help. You know, if one person in that group has some training, he's going to be able to help everybody else come up the par a lot faster. So, you know, you might not know anything today, but you might know a lot more than other people on your street if you do this regularly. You become the block captain. Your rank swells. Now you have two, three other people that you could possibly train. That's the force that makes sense to everybody? Yep. Uh, some stuff we have done, it was mentioned, we went to Joplin to help clean up. Uh, we went to Spanish Lake to help clean up. We also assisted a sheriff department in a search and rescue once for a lost child. Um, it was a rural sheriff. A um, little anecdote about that story that I like. A lot of people showed up. The sheriff's department said, we need volunteers to help with search and rescue. Um, anybody ever walked through the woods of Missouri in summertime? Not the trail, the woods. Yeah. People showed up in shorts, t-shirts, <laughs> brought a water bottle from the grocery store. Our guys showed up in gear. Our guys had canteens. We were organized so you could talk to one person and he can disseminate the information. The deputies didn't have to watch us. They could focus on other things and we could do the search and rescue. So it's just little things like that. So don't think it's out of your reach to be able to do some of this stuff. It's, it's all very doable stuff. A uh, quote from Edmund Burke, uh, all that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to <coughs> Who can join? This is in particular for the militia, but uh, Oath Keepers is, is uh, I don't know if it has any requirements. You just have to join that one. <laughs> uh, everyone can be from 18 to 64 uh, is, is in for the Constitution, but uh, for our particular training purposes, you cannot be a fugitive from justice, an illegal alien, a convicted felon. Uh, you cannot use drugs, be mentally defective, or an undercover agent or agent provocateur. We do do a background check on everyone. Somewhat safe for everyone you're working with. <laughs> All right. So, what exactly do we do? Um, training is a vital part of our operations. It occurs continuously. The training atmosphere is professional and skill focused. Uh, we emphasize on learning and executing skills rather than rigorous physical exercise. Our stated mission is to be a support unit to the state guard. That's it. So there's not going to be a bunch of jogging, you're not going to run a mile and a half every day or anything like that. Uh, we focus on how do we use this stuff. You know, that, that decompression needle Kevin had, um, you, you really need to know what you're doing to use that. You can kill somebody real easy. So that's not something to take lightly. Uh, but 
we do this stuff on a regular basis. We meet twice a month, whether in a classroom or out at various training sites we have, and we practice all this stuff. Twice a year we go out and camp at a private land where we can do a lot. And then once a year, all the state units get together and do a joint training exercise. So a lot of opportunities to get out and practice and do these things. And that's really the key, because remember, training trumps gear and community trumps training. Yeah. So one more thing I'll add, um, as far as community, we'll go to the next slide. So this is the basic training, this is just the stuff we cover on a regular basis. Um, almost every month we touch on some of it. Um, so in community with ham radio, you're talking about getting radios. There was a, when Egypt got attacked a couple of years ago, it really went to pot. There were areas where it was just Mad Max. One of the guys that survived that wrote a memoir, and I think he had it was five or ten points about what he learned and what he would do differently. One of them was ham radio. So that after all this, he was you know, barricaded in his house. They were trying to find food. There were armed people running around. Like three blocks from him, it was normal. Everything was fine. So he said he would definitely get a ham radio because he just couldn't get communication. Phones were off, cell phones were off. There was no way to get information in or out of where he was. Uh, so within all this training, you know, we do it, but we also practice and you build that community. So the Keepers holds uh, ham radio nets twice a month where you can practice. And you can test your equipment. We've had people that have changed their equipment around so they can get in touch with other people. So, yeah, let's say you're in that neighborhood watch group and something bad's happening. Not only do you have the ham radio to talk, but you need to have someone you can talk to that you know you can reach, that you know you can communicate with. Commu uh, committee of Correspondence. 21st century style. So that is really our goal. I think that was my last slide. Oh, no. Um, so, Oath Keepers of Greater St. Louis, that's the URL at the top. If you just Google St. Louis Oath Keepers, this site will come up. <coughs> uh, they meet twice a month, um, weeknights, either Tuesday or Wednesday night. And it varies in location. Uh, this page is great. If you scroll down, there's a bunch of YouTube videos on various uh, trainings and lectures that they've had over the past couple of years. There's a lot of information on this site. Frank, did you? When's your next meeting? It'll be in January. We're just going to have a fellowship on the 29th at the, the VFW on uh, <coughs> Big Ben, South 40. Yeah, first, uh, second Wednesday in January. <coughs> second Wednesday in January. Second Wednesday in January. Fourth Tuesday. And as for the. Uh, you don't you can join our group without joining the national Yeah, you can join the local chapter of Oath Keepers and without joining the national organization. There's no charge or anything. We can come check it out without joining. Yeah. And we do a lot of the medical and presentations. We've had politicians out, we've had law enforcement out to speak. Yeah, we get the email you sent. Yes. Yeah, this site we're also gonna post the PDF with uh, all the slides from today uh, on this site. Uh, Missouri Militia, this is the 3 twos page. This is the St. Louis chapter. Uh, that is the URL at the top. Uh, if you Google Missouri Militia, it'll take you to the main page for the whole state. It's a little hard to find the unit sometimes, so I gave you the URL. We're going to try to post the uh, slides to that as well. All right, and now we have questions. Does anybody like to ask any of the presenters? I want to ask on you real quick how many militia units are there in Missouri? when you said you do a joint thing. 